Welcome to the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author, Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator, Michelle Brigman. Come here weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Hi, I'm Fawn Germer. And I'm Michelle Brigman. And this is the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast. Today, boy, you are going to get the mother load of Hard Won Wisdom. Our guest is Wendy Stanzler, Hollywood director, who has done episodes of shows that I love, like Sex and the City. You've heard of that. How about Ugly Betty, Orange is the New Black, Desperate Housewives, Parks and Rec. This list goes on and on. She got her start on the film Roger and Me and has just kept rolling ever since. But boy, did she learn a lot doing what she's doing that's going to help you be more successful. Didn't you think, Michelle? Oh my gosh. She is going to help you throw out the window that excuse you've been giving of, I can't do that because I don't know enough. When you hear how she got started, man, she just went on blind faith and excitement around something she was curious about. And I mean, what an amazing career that she is having. That's so right. you cannot miss this. So, Wendy Stanzler, take it away. Tell us about Wendy. Hi, I'm Wendy Stanzler. I'm talking to you from Los Angeles, a Flint, Michigan girl who uh, started as a television editor and eventually uh, made my way into directing, which is what I do now. Um, I have one child who's 17, a wonderful young man, Henry. Um, he is looking at colleges and our life is going to change a whole lot very quickly. Um, but I sort of, you know, I don't know how I got here. I just sort of got really lucky and one thing led to another. and. Something that I was afraid to dream about ended up being what I am doing for a living. So it's really interesting. It's really interesting. I often say, I always forgot the word entitled when I was trying to describe people who made these assumptions about what they deserve. Because I couldn't, I felt like I grew up in this humble working class place where people didn't feel entitled. So I would be, you know, people that feel like they deserve what they get. I never, kind of went through life like that. But I think what informed me and probably you too, is that, you know, we grew up around people that worked hard, you know, a town where people work for General Motors and they work their asses off long days. And so I approach what I do with, you know, with the idea of working really hard and um, it's paid off so far. <laughs> um, and I'm a television director. It, it- is an amazing thing to say that I, I know somebody who's a director in Hollywood on big shows, not on little shows, on shows that I watch, on episodes that I have watched multiple times. So what are the big ones? Except they're all big ones. <laughs> um, it's interesting because they're all so different. People look at my resume and kind of go, that's, that's an interesting resume because it's not like I found one thing that I loved and just did it. Um, I found people that I thought were doing great work and interesting work stuff that I wanted to watch or, or at a point in my son's life, you know, things that I thought he would want to watch. And so I would pursue those like DC or Marvel action stuff. Cause when he was a teenager, you know, when he was in middle school, he was into it. So I was like, no, I'll go direct arrow. And, um, which ended up being, you know, a really great step like it was just something that was uh, a really fun job with a lot of fun people and that kind of program is can be really exciting and it's unusual for women um, especially at the time because it was early on first season Um, it was unusual to be a director and a female doing that so it was a real pleasure and a real thrill Um, you know I went on to do things like Parks and Rec because Mike Schur who's a you know, comedy showrunner is probably one of the smartest people in Hollywood. So to work with him was something that was just like, I'd love to do that. Now um, I'm trying to kind of guide my career to things that are more the stuff that I watch. I just finished 
uh, two episodes of For All Mankind for Apple Television, which if you haven't seen it is a really brilliant show. It's Ron Moore, who's a great showrunner, along with um, Matt Walpert and Ben Nadivi. And it's this kind of retelling of the space program. And it's pretty brilliant. And I'm off to do a limited release series for Apple based on uh, the novel Five Days in at Memorial, which is the story of uh, kind of what happened in this hospital during Hurricane Katrina and oh. the aftermath. So it's a limited release, eight episode uh, series that'll be out sometime next year. But you've done things like Grey's Anatomy, mm-hmm. Orange is the New Black, she did some Parks and Rec. Um, this is us. Mm-hmm. Um, sex in the City, man. <laughs> you almost forgot that one. I can forget <laughs> that one. It's, it's like when that was when I first heard that my old friend from Sunday school had made it big. Was that I knew somebody who was connected somehow to Sex in the City, and and I was just saying to Wendy. How does somebody from Flint, Michigan, wind up in Hollywood, California? That's and and so what's what's it started with that famous Flint movie and yeah. how, tell that story. You know, it's really interesting because I remember that famous Flint movie is Roger and Me, and it's a documentary about Flint, Michigan, directed by Michael Moore. And I was involved with it. You know, pretty much the duration of the project, I was assistant camera and sound recording. You'll see me kind of walking around at the beginning of the film with this like Nagra, which is an old fashioned recording and a boom. Um, and, uh, and I remember when we took that film to Telluride and Gene Siskel, the film yeah. critic, no longer with us, one of the brilliant films, said what he loved about the film was that you like found a thread and just sort of followed the thread. And the story, and then it led to like, a piece of fabric that was this interesting. And then that led to, and that's sort of, you know, the art of the way Michael tells stories. He's sort of, you know, and it's like a journalist. I'm sure, Fon, that you can relate to that kind of conceptually. And, and uh, I have to say that- who, Wait, wait, hang on a second. For those who um, weren't around for that epic film, I mean, because it's been a while, was it really showed how our town became unwound by yeah. General Motors? Yeah, it was really kind of, you know, it's it was prescient by about 20 years to what corporate greed does to the American dream. And basically what, you know, in my mind, here's an entire community. Flint was not alone, but it's where it all began. There are towns all throughout this country that, you know, built big giant corporations like General Motors to be the huge monoliths that they are. And then, you know, when the demands for taking care of those people became too complex or too uh, ate into the profits too much, they took these companies to places where they could exploit um, people that were poorer and weren't organized and didn't have, you know, the bargaining power that the workers over the years had earned. So, um, so at the time it felt like, oh, this one little town, like how sad, you know, this corporation, you know, kind of betrayed and, uh, left this town in ruins, you know, it's kind of something that we see and we've seen over and over again since then. So yeah, it was a great, a great film, a great experience, an important film, an important storyteller who Michael is. And, uh, that's where it all started. And I think that I, you know, it was so narrative as a documentary. It was really the style of it um, was a little non-traditional. It was really kind of like if you you could, it wasn't, but you could script something that would be told in that same fashion. And I realized that while I really still love documentaries, you know, I do, uh, my real passion was with narrative film. And the idea that, uh, and I still haven't realized that yet professionally, and I still hope that, you know, I, I have, that's my like North Star, is to somehow, you know, intertwine the politics of someone like a Michael Moore or, you know, Steven Soderbergh can do, you know, or just somebody that, you know, there are so many people that do this, 
but to tell narrative stories that have political, kind of subliminal political um, messaging and stories that hold up, you know, working class heroes or, you know, single mothers or, you know, just people that generally are not, that are heroes, but for some reason our culture doesn't perceive them as heroes. But I do. Well, okay. earlier you were, we were discussing a little bit about even your father and I'm I just, that's what I'm hearing screaming at me as you're telling your goal, your aspiration is to be able mm -hmm. to do these narratives around the everyday hero, because yeah. that's exactly what he represented. Definitely. In, in, in his community and in, 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 well, I mean, greater than that based on um, some of that. So I don't know, maybe there's some connection there too. Definitely. I definitely had role models, both my father, while my parents were both in the medical profession, you know, and, and were really compassionate and caring and old time kind of doctors that were in it, not before it became corporate medicine and all that. Um, and, and even though, you know, HMOs and things came along at the end of their careers, they didn't become part of those systems. And they were really scared of those systems because of the lack of humanity in what needs to be the most humane thing in the world, which is medical care for human beings, right? So both my father and my mother, you know, were really involved in the community that we grew up in, which was Flint. My father was very involved in uh, investigating and fighting police brutality, like very devoted a lot of his life to that. And the study of firearms policies in police departments around the country which at the time there were none. And he became an expert in that, just in his own, you know, and speaking and traveling and, and you know, shedding light on a lot of police brutality 30 plus years ago. Um, and my mom, who was also in the medical profession, you know, was very involved in Planned Parenthood and, you know, a lot of her female patients, she was an obstetrician. And in Flint, you know, I think when you are in like a beautiful community like Los Angeles or, you know, your beautiful neighborhoods, you know, you think of these wealthy doctors and wow, like that's, the, you know, I want to be a rich doctor. You know, yes, there were some of those in Flint, but it wasn't, a, you know, the community wasn't um, an affluent community. So they weren't these like mega medical practices. And a lot of my mom's patients were women that, you know, didn't have insurance or didn't have, you know, the proper care or didn't have, you know, didn't have the money for nutrition or what have you. And a lot, you know, I remember her saying, I'll be home late. I'm trying to find beds for this woman who's, you know, about, you know, midway through her pregnancy. So both of them were incredibly compassionate and, you know, thought a lot more about other people than a lot of people that I would, you know, kind of notice. And it really meant a lot. And I, I, I really admired and appreciated that. And it definitely informed me and my siblings. And, uh, and I think that they did a lot of good in the very, you know, in their kind of micro way. And, you know, that's all it takes is for people where they are to do those things. And the cumulative effect is a better world, right? Right. But and with, with that, the megaphone that you have from the kind of work you do, you, you can have a huge impact on all of that. Did you know growing up that you wanted to go into being some sort of film director or in, in anything like that? And then when you started doing Roger and Me, what kind of a defining moment was that? What was the realization of, of the impact on your life? Um, you know, it's interesting. I had been at, I had gone to uh, college and I ended up at Michigan State and I wanted to take a film class because I always, you know, I love television. I love film. I grew up in front of some kind of image of light, you know, and a story being told. It was an escape. It was a, it was a way to feel like there's a big world out there that was kind of thrilling and possible, you know. And so it always like gave me this feeling of possibility um, and entertainment and all those other things. And when I got to Michigan State, I was like, you know what, I, I'd love to take a film class. And there were no film classes. There was like, they, I think they had, they were, it was a while ago. Now they have like really good program and classes there. But uh, I was taking an English class with this guy whose last name was Lopez, I think. And his parents, he was from Los Angeles and his parents had worked 
for the Desi Lu production company. I had, it was really crazy, but I thought there's my one degree of separation. That was the motivation. I felt a million miles away from anybody that did anything in that field. I didn't see a path. I didn't know how to get there. I wanted to, but I didn't even have kind of the courage or confidence to even utter the words. But when I met him, I thought, there's a human in this room with me who's involved. I'm now one degree of separation. It's real. And so I was like, what am I going to do? I ended up taking a film class at the Los, uh, what was it? Lansing Community College while I was at Michigan State. And it was a filmmaking class. You know, some guy who had come out to L.A. and then come home because L.A. wasn't for him. And he started teaching film in East Lansing. On the board one day was a Xerox, you know, with the little pieces of paper that you tear off with a phone number. And it was these dudes in Detroit making a horror film, Sam Raimi and all those guys, you know, Rob Tapper, the people that have gone. I mean, they're like huge in the business. But at the time, there were these guys that had gone to Michigan State, had made Evil Dead, had done this cult, amazing horror film. And they were looking for people to work on this film. And so I called and I ended up going to Detroit during the week, sleeping on somebody's floor one summer, working in the sound department. The sound um, designer was, um, um, oh my name, he's the actor in all the films. It'll come back to me. Um, he was the sound, I worked under him. And it was, you know, pretty harsh, you know, kind of violent crazy film, but I enjoyed it so much. I thought, God, what if it was something that spoke more to me in terms of, you know, style? And so I applied to film school and I applied to Ohio University Film School. And I think there weren't a lot of women there at the time. So they gave me a really good package, financial package. And I started there. And in the meantime, Michael Moore was thinking about, you know, he had just gotten um, let go from Mother Jones. He was kind of licking his wounds in Flint. And uh, just somehow this idea of this documentary became a thing. Oh, also, he had worked with some documentarians who were doing a film in Flint about white supremacists. So it was just sort of this like perfect storm. And when he started making the film, I sort of started kind of coming back, you know, anytime filming was happening. And, you know, that's how it started. Um, I was in documentary a little bit, but as I said, like, I, I really, you know, wanted to somehow do more narrative work and, you know, eventually moved to New York. And while I was doing documentary, found my way into narrative, actually through Michael, again, through his feature, Canadian Bacon, he hired this phenomenal editor named Jerry Peroni, who had been Robert Altman's editor. She was amazing. She came down through the lineage of Thelma Schoenmacher, who was Martin Scorsese's collaborator. She was married to um, Michael, oh, ah, the guy who did red shoes. I mean, she was royalty. So there was Thelma, Jerry, and Jerry was gracious enough to say to Michael, oh, I'll, I'll co-edit the film with her. And so that was the first time I had worked on narrative footage and that, and it was, Wendy, I have a, I have a question for you. Sorry, to interrupt, but, but there, there's a couple of things that you, you shared there. I mentor women and specifically women in business so often, and they are afraid they they will talk themselves out of everything because I don't have the experience and going back to you sharing your story, you, you, I mean, you didn't have experience. Mm -mm. So just, I mean, get words of encouragement in terms of talking yourself out of doing something before you even get started. I mean, what right. advice would you give those women? Shut yourself up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, it really is. I, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there were so many times I felt like, oh my God, I'm in the, I'm in the deep end of the pool and I don't really know how to swim. But that's the, after you do that the first time, and it creates kind of this, and you get through it, it creates this sense of strength and the sense of, okay, I survived that. I can do it again. 
throw yourself back into the deep end. And each time it gets easier and easier. And then I think you look for the deep end because, you know, what happens in doing that is something generally worthwhile. Um, and definitely, if it's not ultimately something that you think is worthwhile, the personal satisfaction of surviving that and getting through it, accomplishing it, good, bad, whatever, is a feeling that you have to then hold on to, nurture, keep that flame burning, look for the deep end. It's just the way it is. Oh, and not to be, you know, and if you are afraid, which we all are, and say, I'm afraid, but I'm going to fucking do it anyway. I hope I can. On the podcast. You can. It's all right. Okay. That's, you're Hollywood. <laughs> you can say a lot. I've been afraid so often. I'm afraid every time I start a job. I'm worried that really? it's going to work out, that uh, other people, on, you know, I, yeah. I mean, I think the idea of that voice of criticize of self, I don't want to say criticism, but I guess that's what it is. That's such a negative connotation. No, but, it's yeah. the female imposter syndrome, which I'm hoping people get beyond that. But do you think that at some point they're going to say, oh, she did, really doesn't know what she's doing? I think you obviously get past that. But um, but I do think men feel that way as well. It is it is something that I've heard men say as well. But yes, I think we, you know, I think it's definitely part of our, you know, kind of gender uh, of evolution and what, you know, I, I, I'm not going to deny that, but I do feel like the voice in your head that is scared, that says, I can't is something that is not uncommon. And so if it's in your head, just know that that connects you to everybody else that's done stuff, everybody else that's like achieved what you want to achieve. You're now connected to them because you have that voice in your head because you're trying you know, just try. And all you can, you know, trying is the, is it. You just try, you know, and generally when you do, something comes of it. It sets you on a path that is either a direct line to what you want or a circuitous line to what you want. But if you embrace that, and then it maybe becomes this trigger like oh i'm uncomfortable i must be in a good place i'm nervous i'm scared this must mean that it's important you know so maybe using recognizing that as something that is a positive sign not a negative sign like you're challenging yourself you're being brave you're you know pushing yourself you're going to achieve something just because you're doing that um, that is amazing when when you are out there in the deep end of the pool Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a situation where you thought you were going to drown and then you drowned? Yeah, I, I feel like people sometimes in this line of work are like, oh, I'm the director. It's me. My name's up there. You know, don't look at anyone else. It's just me. You know, I think that as women doing this, you realize and, you know, you realize that, wow, this is like, look at that person without their enthusiasm and experience and talent as the costume designer this wouldn't look like this without this person's lighting and camera work. It wouldn't look like that. And, and, and the best directors and managers are the people that support, praise, encourage the, the talent that's around you. And ultimately, you know, that's what I think is a great director. I think it's somebody that acknowledges kind of, you know, the team and what we do and people that are, you know, willing to try something that maybe they didn't think of and find a way to like make it amazing. But, you know, no person, I mean, aside from maybe a novelist, I mean, who does something by themselves? None of well, us really. So the well, idea we yeah, and we've worked for these leaders and worked with these leaders that bring out your very best, but we've also all worked with the assholes. For How sure. Talk a little bit about how you how you've had to navigate some of your experiences with those, whether they're the stars, the actors and actresses, or the you know colleague that's the direct. Talk a little bit about that. It's hard, you know. That's really hard. It's I'm sensitive, even though you know, I think people don't encourage sensitivity. Um, I 
you know, I feel those things. And I think you just go home, lick your wounds and come back. And, you know, you're, you've got to be a really good poker player. You've got to kind of, you know, get yourself through difficult situations and realize unless you say something, nobody knows what you're thinking. Nobody knows what you're feeling. Your thoughts and feelings are private unless you share them. So if you're dying inside because somebody has been rude to you or, you know, chances are it's not you. They're like that to everyone. And chances are they have a reputation for being a major asshole and you're just the latest person to come up against it. And honestly, go home feeling sorry for them because they've got to go home to themselves and you don't have to go home to them. So I think that ultimately that's what happens, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly this, this business in particular encourages bad behavior. Um, star building is a terrible thing. People are led to believe that, you know, all there be, I mean, it's changing thankfully, but uh, you know, it's okay, we'll tolerate their behavior because they're so talented or what have you. I've always thought that was bullshit, but you know, it is kind of the culture. Ultimately, I think if you, I'll tell you one thing, and this is specifically female. If I had not become a mother, I was seven and a half months pregnant when I got my directing break on Sex in the City. So I was a giant waddling pregnant woman Live, you know, all of my dreams coming true. I was older parents. I had wanted a baby. It took forever. I had wanted to direct that too took forever. And it all happened at once. And it was just like the most incredible thing. But afterwards, you know, I, I thought as I like continued down this path and I, I was more generous with jerk. I was, and I think it was really becoming a parent. And had I not been a mom to a child that I had to, you know, put myself aside, I had to not take things personally, I had to, you know, the, the parent in me was far more generous than the single woman that I had been. Cause before I'd been like, what a fucking asshole. Right. But, you know, then I would be like, that person's tragic. Like, I feel badly for them. Like they are them too, you know? And so I think that the generosity uh, shifted and I became more generous for sure. And I think that that helped kind of, I don't know, tolerate, be more generous and compassionate with people that have problems. And a lot of people have problems. We all do. Um, some of us are more capable of leaving them out of the workplace, but some aren't. And that's a that's a problem for them, and so I, I was able to be more compassionate, understanding, um, and I think that that helped. It's interesting that you seem so kind and authentic in an industry that is just so famous for being so harsh and inauthentic, where everything is fake. So how have you managed to be yourself in a world where everybody is trying to be somebody else? I, I was ready. To, I, I would walk away. I would have walked away. I just knew. I mean, first of all, I'm not a child. I, I had worked for a long time before this happened. So I was already a professional editor. And, um, you know, while I would have been destroyed had, you know, I failed, um, I, I was ready to leave at any point when I felt like I couldn't be myself. And I felt like, and I, I say this to all the female viewers, you're wonderful and trust yourself. And, you know, you don't have to compromise. I mean, you can make small compromises, but in general, I just thought if I have to pretend to be somebody other than what I am, I just can't do that. Just like, that'll make me ill. That'll, that'll probably create some kind of disease inside of me that will make me physically ill because life's too short. I don't like those people. I don't want to be like them. I want to be myself. And if I can't survive in this, then I'll do something else. I mean, it was really that simple. I just, I'll do something else. And early on, and I, you know, I don't, I think naming names and stuff on radio programs, it's a bad idea. 
But early on, I had a showrunner who, right when I was beginning, there's a thing called a steady cam in filming. A steady cam is a camera that somebody wears and it's on like a, a kind of hinge so that you move around and it is always kind of, it never goes sideways or backwards. And it's something with you see a long oh, yeah, shot yeah. with people walking and stuff, that's usually shot with a steady cam. This producer said, because I was really young and new, well, not really young, but I was really new. And he said, okay, this is what you do to win over the, the crew. Do a big one like a big steady cam shot. Do it once, say cut and print. And when you say print, that means you're moving on to the next shot, right? And I looked at him, he was an actor, director. And I looked at him and I was like, that's the most horrible advice I've ever heard. So you want me to act like I'm a director, like you act like you're a director, like, no, bad advice, but it's similar, but it's, you know, kind of classic Hollywood advice. Like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of it's smoke and mirrors and a lot of it's, but, you know, I think that I, I was ready to just sort of say, if I had to compromise too much or in a major way, I just, I couldn't do it. No way. So that, I hope that answers the question. I just, at a certain age, I just, I couldn't do it. I just have to go home every night and be with myself. And I just couldn't be with myself if I felt like what I was doing was a huge moral compromise. Well, I think a lot of people find themselves in their corporate jobs experiencing something like that and wondering, you know, how they're, they're going to make it. And I just, I think it's interesting that you've been able to balance that that reality and, and soul. I know that perhaps that's a privileged way to look at things. And I know that, you know, if it was the difference between having food on the table and not, I certainly would make the compromise. And I've made small compromises for sure. But the bigger compromise, which is betraying your sense of who you are and, and not taking care of yourself in a huge kind of important way because you know that ultimately doesn't change anything and change is necessary especially for women in corporate america women in entertainment and i always at this point now that i'm older and have more experience you know oftentimes there are certain kind of positions on the set that are generally male although that's changing generally like these low hard you know kind of big personalities that at this point in my career, I take them all on. I look, uh, I take them on. And it's because there will be younger women with opportunities that will follow me and they will not have the courage to do that because they're beginning. And as somebody who's not beginning, as somebody who is further along, I, I'm Don Quixote, man. I'm looking for those dragons because I'm paving the way for my daughter. I don't have a daughter, theoretically. Right. I'm giving the way for my sis, my young, my friend's daughter who wants to do this and doesn't have the experience or the courage yet to like stand up to the bully. But I don't care anymore. And I will because of them. I don't want them to have to experience it. So at a certain point, I think women that are my age that are, you know, in leadership, you know, it then becomes our responsibility to do our best to, you know face the problem and try to change it. Do you still see a lot of women backstabbing one another? Because I mean, I still see that so often in corporate, the corporate world where rather than doing exactly what you described, it's your sense of responsibility and obligation to lift up, pave the way, help champion. There's still so much bullshit and backstabbing. And I'm, I'm curious how you've seen this evolve where you are. Um, I think that in my profession, the director's guild and a lot of like women in film and different programs, the studios, um, you know, we're in a very public profession. We're in, we're delivering up stuff that goes directly to the consumer. And, and um, you know, I think as a result, there's not a lot of like closed door, you know, corporate stuff that nobody understands. We understand it. It's a story on a screen, right? 
And we understand when the only people that are being nominated for awards are white men, or when you know, uh, you know, there's just a lack of opportunity for people that are different. And so I think there's a long way to go, but I do feel like there has been accountability and we're in the beginning, you know, of that changing in our industry. And I also think Me Too currently has, you know, you, I mean, that's the funniest thing is listening to dudes my age or older grumble on set. It's like, well, I can't even like, talk anymore i'm like i remember coming to set from the editing room thinking what am i in high school like what is wrong with these adult professional men who talk like they're like 12 like my 12 year old son would never speak like this in public so in a way it's a favor to them like why shouldn't adult men act like grown-ups right and professional grown-ups at, at that so i do feel like things have changed um I have seen women that I, you know, that have, that I'm like, I usually am like really aghast by a woman who isn't like living her life with the idea that relating to a younger woman that's further down the path. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, sh I know that I've seen it. It's not a big issue that I've come across. Um, I'm sure that it's there and I'm sure that people have experienced it. I have, I'd say mostly I, I see that kind of bad behavior. I would have, you know, less and less, of course, but, um, with my male colleagues, you know, not so much my female colleagues. Um, but I'm certain that there are women that have see, you know, opportunity as precious and, you know, that they would you know, like anyone push somebody out of the way for the opportunity, they got to live with themselves. I hope that once they achieve whatever their goal is, that then they can become generous. But I haven't seen too much of that. And perhaps I have blinders on because, you know, I kind of try to create a culture when I'm on set that feels something that's comfortable for me. Um, and so I do think that you as a director, like help to, um, create whatever the vibe is. So I'm definitely creating the vibe that I want to exist in. And there's no room for those people. So perhaps they crawl into the woodwork for the moment that I'm there and then they can crawl back out when I'm gone. But well, the leader makes a big difference in terms yeah. of the culture, right? I mean, they, you yeah. set the tone for behaviors, what's yeah. tolerated, what's not. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's really sad that, that certain workplaces have not, you know, kind of had much growth or evolution in that, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird time right now. I mean, it is, but I just cannot yeah. believe after all these years mm -hmm. that we're still saying Hollywood's going to be nice to women now. Right. Or when, you know, when, when, when are women going to have a chance? I, you know, I mean, I remember, didn't we think when Thelma and Louise came out that, okay, this is it finally. <laughs> And, you know, wasn't I in my 20s when that <laughs> happened? Right. And we're having the same discussions. And I, 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 I don't know what it's going to take, but the, the fallout of the fact that that hasn't happened is so huge because not only, you know, we want roles for women, we want recognition, we want opportunities. But until you get women in those positions, that's not going to change the way the rest of the world sees women in the world. Right. So it's I mean, I think the, the kind of gift to where we are right now are places, you know, not to, you know, not to say specifically, but, you know, Netflix and Hulu and all these places providing opportunities for more content. And I have to say, I have noticed that, you know, Phoebe Waller-Bridges, you know, was like this breath of fresh air. And, and now I seem to notice like all these little shows like Feel Good, Starstruck, where there are these auteur female writers that are starring in these shows. I feel like that suddenly is like blossoming and women are telling their stories or, in, you know, or entertaining stories about characters that they've created. Um, it's the bigger budget things that are more problematic for women yeah. and people of color um, that, you know, that's the harder jar to open. 
because of the amount of money. And there's also, there's always been this like, you know, a woman does a film that doesn't make box office, she's dead. A guy has a few shots, right? So I would think that the stuff at the top, the more expensive, the bigger budget, um, things are the things that are harder. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a definitely a slow moving train in every way. Like I think about, I mean, just the political landscape, you know, how can, you know, look at Stacey Abrams. Oh my God. Right. Oh, I hear what her. Yeah. capable of? Look at her, you know? So that's like, I, you know, those are, there are lots of women out there that need to be empowered to just sort of, uh, in a grassroots way, you know, just slowly, you know, kind of move in the direction towards the change they want to see. I feel like on a certain level, I've done that. I'm certain that the two of you have as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's shocking that it's that we still find our yeah. ourselves in certain situations that feel, you know, it really comes down to who has the money and who has the power. And, you know, part of the reason why things are so ugly, like I keep thinking about, you know, when the dinosaurs died out, like walking- oh, a forest when the dinosaurs were dying, the, the noise must have been so loud. It must have been deafening. And I feel like in a lot of ways, that's what we're living through now. But, you know, we still have a, a ways to go and there's no certainty. And around that comes a lot of fear and hate, like as we're seeing a lot of growth of, uh, you know, white supremacy and a lot of hate. But all of that feels like it's because they fear the change that's imminent. So I have to sort of look at the world that way and hope. And wow, that, that is an interesting way to look at it. You know, um, Michelle, Wendy and I hooked up right when um, politically things started getting a little uncomfortable for us. And we were trying to make sense of this changing world. And but that's true. You're right. When they're when you talk about the d dinosaurs vanished, the silence was so loud. And, you know, having worked in a newsroom for so long. When the newsroom went quiet, it was like, that's the loudest noise there ever is. Yeah. And then after the noise, that's uh, it only happened when something big was going to change. And yeah. You know, Me Too happened right as Trump was being elected. You know how weird is that? Would that have happened? I mean, I, I would have given anything for not having that presidency for sure. I mean, and I don't know whether, but yeah, and we don't want to offend any of our listeners. We right. welcome but, everybody. Some it's, <laughs> we all have to figure out how to talk. That's the one thing I can't figure that out yet is like how we bridge that. Well, I was just going to say, like, I think that, you know, would those things have happened had it been, you know, did he did just his being in office bring about all this change and if so yeah maybe you know you know it's, it's just complicated it's complicated and difficult and you're right this there are other things to talk about in this hour but you know those are things that have to be talked about at some but what i yeah you know, i'm curious is how we bridge gaps but that's a different show yeah because we we got to bring everybody together but i do i do know people want to know <laughs> <laughs> like what's a really good day for you or what's what is it when you have fun I mean, what's what's your most fun i love to play tennis so playing at tennis work okay now tennis yeah we'll talk about me swimming, but not at work what's the most uh, fun you ever had at work you know i uh what was the most i mean i have to say probably the biggest russians i have this memory of my first day on set with my first episode of television Sex in the City, the first scene that I shot was the scene in, in the last season when Samantha's in the back of the uh, taxi telling uh, Sarah Jessica Carey that she has cancer. That was the first thing. And I was like trying to climb up on the back of this truck, seven and a half months pregnant. And I'm like a big girl. And I just remember going, like pinching myself, like, how did this happen? Like, I, and I, and it's like a visceral feeling of like being like, you know, when you were drinking and you feel a buzz or whatever, it was like that. It was so intoxicating. I'll never forget that feeling ever. 
And I feel that way still. You know, I just did um, For All Mankind and this actor, Joel Kinnaman, who's a brilliant actor and watching him, it's just like, wow, I am so, and like, and then like collaborating on things and, you know, finding your way with an actor towards greatness is like such, a, it, it's intoxicating and amazing. So, you know, that I do feel like, I feel lucky every time I go to work. I do feel like this is incredible because I'm the girl that watched the Brady Bunch in my living room. I'm the black and white television. And now I'm the girl, woman, girl, on set in front of the monitors, which is like my little black and white television on steroids, watching it 10 feet away from the actor who's performing it. And I get to have that same feeling. And I trust my feelings from that kid who, you know, became totally immersed in whatever I was watching. And I'm there. That, and being an editor, you know, was a great transition because you are a viewer on steroids. Again, like you're sitting there watching the footage going, I'm moved by this. I believe this. I don't believe this. Look at how that person's watching. Like I'm going to cut to them watching what this person's saying because I feel the way they look. And so you're just really inhabiting everyone. Because I think that, you know, when you're really into something as a viewer, in a way, you're inhabiting the character. Like you're so, like, there's no separation between you and them. And so, you know, in my current work, I'm just a little closer to it and I have some influence on it, which is really fun. Or no influence. Like, you know, I worked with uh, Melissa Leo on that um, Dolly Parton thing. And, you know, that woman is fearless. And, you know, just to be like, uh, you know, just speechless at like, there's a scene where she's kind of going nuts and she takes this wedding cake. She steals the wedding, her daughter's wedding cake because her daughter eloped and she's undone because she wanted this like Southern wedding and show off her daughter. So she goes and steals the wedding cake, goes up to her room and she just start, just shoved it in her face. And it was just like, what? So, you know, there are things that you can imagine, but then the actor, your collaborator does it and you're just like, don't stop rolling. This is amazing. And there are moments like that in pretty much everything, you know, that you do. Yeah, there are difficult moments trying to coerce somebody into doing something that you had in mind, whether it was the better idea or whether their idea was better. It's like, let's try both and see. Um, but I... I do feel pretty excited doing what I do. Like I feel like that kid back in Flint watching whatever, you know, Johnny Quest. <laughs> you know, remember sort of we were Johnny Quest. You're singing my <laughs> song, Sister Brady Bunch, Johnny Quest. You know, <laughs> Michelle just messaged me and said she's in a joy moment. Look at her. I wish you could have seen yourself <laughs> describing yeah. your happiness with your, in your passion for what you do. I wish that for every person who listens to this, that they could have that kind of a draw into their work. Definitely. And, you know, yes, it's like, it's great that it's your work, but if it's even just the thing that you do, you know, like I have friends that weave and that's their happy place. Like they, they're, they, they're a mom during the day, but you know, that when things are done, they weave or, you know, they need, I just bought a needle point <laughs> because my mom used to needle point. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to needle point a pillow for my son to take to college. That's my goal. That's so sweet. You know, whatever you like, they're cooking, you know, cooking. I love to cook. I love feeding people. Like that's something that's really meaningful to me. If somebody truly gets pleasure out of something that I cook, I couldn't be happier. Like, so there are things that you, there are ways that we find this joy if our work is a little more mundane or, and, you know, or it's just like we have a pay the bills job, then find that joy elsewhere. But, you know, or just being with people, you know, just being with people like the two of you just having this morning with you guys. It's like, oh my God, it's so awesome. I love it. <laughs> oh, I mean, it really, I, I, that's why I say, aren't we lucky that we're women? I mean, I, I, Made oh my the God. grievous error when I, I first was having my awakening of saying to this 
great feminist judge. You know, men make more money and they rule the world. But if I had to choose between being a man and a woman, I would still choose being a woman. And she looked at me and she said, really? She goes, well, I want all of it. (laughs) (laughs) And, And I get it. But at its core, I mean, yeah. I really I do. I want all of it, but I would not sacrifice this, this ability. I mean, you know, you've never met Michelle before, but here we're like three girlfriends, which guys don't do easily unless they're talking about football. And that's not insulting. It's just true. Yeah, I think it's a real there. I mean, I'm hoping that that, you know, I have a younger son. And I do see like that has changed for his generation, like the ability to, you know, kind of be more expressive and, but, but it's true. Our generation, I wouldn't want to be stuck behind, you know, that's just not, no way, no way, no way. I feel like women in my life, my friends, my sister, my mother, um, who's no longer in my life, but you know, those are the people that, feed your soul and not to have that like right yeah that's like that's like not having legs or something right it's like not having something critical to existence and I don't know how people exist without it all about the relationship and Um, it's like even for the people who listen to this I mean I want I want them feeling that sisterhood too because we can make stronger women just by showing that and how how we connect and that but also hearing them recognize by some hearing something saying, oh, my gosh, that thing that I thought was, a, you know, a weakness or a problem in myself, that's actually my superpower. Right. So that, I see this and it's painful for me, but I see it, you know, wow, most people don't see that. That's a gift, you know, or whatever. You know, I do feel like oftentimes we are taught that the things that men are scared of our strength that they are incapable of having that we have, you know, and I think it's fearful. I think that, you know, getting back, I'm not going to, but certainly, you know, you know, that's a fear in Washington. That's a fear in the workplace, you know, that, you know, look at AOC, like she's terrifying people, you know, it's because she doesn't care. Like she's that generation. She's, there's nothing in her head other than her parents saying you're strong and do, you know, take care of yourself, you know? And, well, I mean, and I have to say when she started at first, I wasn't quite ready for that. And I remember I, I posted something and my friend said, stop it. And I, I just thought she, she needs to learn to work within the system. So she's effective. That's what I'm thinking. But then after time, I realized she found her own way to be effective by not working within the system. And, and that's a generational thing that I'm, I'm working with now to understand because there's a lot we need to learn from younger people that, yes. that, that they changed the rules and by golly, they were right about them. And who established the system? It wasn't us. Right. Well, it and wasn't. The system that's... was established in a lot of ways to keep us in a place that, yeah. you know, we're less threatening and, you know, not going to be trying to grab the brass ring that didn't belong to us. Yeah, right. Yeah every right to that. So right I think <laughs> we, we should let Michelle wrap so that then we go into our juicy after show, which people can hear at the women's leadership network. But um, so what, what was the takeaway? Uh, Wendy, oh, so many great nuggets. I loved all this. I loved all the stories. A um, couple of things that really stood out to me that as a listener, just I can take back and be part of sort of the, the mantra and affirmations. But I loved when you were talking about how feeling uncomfortable is a really good indicator that you're on the path and also recognizing um, when that voice in your head is, you know, that fear voice is speaking that actually you taking that action is really the signal to yourself that you're being brave. You talked about just, just try because there's always something positive that comes from it. I loved keep throwing yourself in the deep end. So you're always seeking that next challenge. I loved um, just a reminder that it, it takes people where they are doing things that matter that can have a very profound impact on the world. And I think 
um, even at the end here, you talked about just oftentimes your perceived weakness is actually your own superpower. But my favorite thing you said in the very beginning, and then under hearing your story throughout all of this was, what I was afraid to dream about is what I ended up doing. And I leave that with our listeners because yeah. that thing that you keep putting in the shadows, you need to bring out in the light because it's possible for you to achieve that. So thank you so much for sharing your life and your story with us. What a, what a, we're just so grateful. It was a, a real pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me to do that. What a great <laughs> recap because that there's so much power in all those things. Uh, it's and Michelle finds them all and man, Wendy, that was great. So anyhow, for those of you leaving us now, goodbye. The rest of you, <laughs> see you at the women's pleasure League. to meet everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining the Hard One Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Von Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Join us weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Visit hardwonwisdom.com for more on this podcast and for links to Fawn and Michelle's webpages and social media. Also, be sure to rate, subscribe, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort, and we'll see you next week.